Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Ricky, for the introduction. Um, there's a bit of overlapping between uh, the Secretary for Development's uh, presentation and mine, and I'll just try to flip through those that are overlap with her. So uh, let's begin. This is the first time I, uh, I participated in the Urban Age Conference. I, I really don't know what to expect of, so I was asked to, I was given 10 minutes and uh, 10 slides, something. I, I go beyond that in terms of slides, but I hope to keep to the 10 minutes. Now, uh, I don't need to go through the basic statistics of Hong Kong because I'm sure that you've been uh, bombarded with them over the past few days. Uh, I would like, uh, though, to point out the, this map below. This is a map produced by my department uh, using uh, uh, remote sensing and GIS for the urban area. And, and I just want to highlight that all these are mountains in Hong Kong. Most of these development, urban development, are basically uh, reclaimed land. Uh, over the year, we have claimed, we claimed almost 90% of Hong Kong Island and for various uses like the port in Hong Kong, the airport, and the urban development and the commercial development along the northern coast of Hong Kong Island. So it is as much by design as it is by default that we have vertical development, highly high density, and very compact urban form. I don't need to go through this. Now, we have a lot of problem, and again, uh, that's been highlighted in the morning, so I really want, don't really want to go into them, but just flip through it, and we can come back to it uh, if you have any question. Now, back in 2007, we have completed a strategic study for Hong Kong called the Hong Kong 2030 study. Uh, we roughly do a strategic study uh, once every 10 years. Uh, we have adopted the so-called the um, Integrated Land Use Transport and Environment Framework to guide developments in Hong Kong. What this means is that actually back in the 80s, we used this transport model, land use and transport model, to, as, a, as a, a, a guide for development. In the 90s, we realized that that is not enough. We have to look at environment right at the very beginning. So we adopted this uh, framework. What this means is that uh, We've done study. We, we conducted studies, for instance, for fish points. We have wetlands in Hong Kong which are frequented by migratory birds uh, during the winter seasons. Um, we've done study. We know the ecology of the wetland area, the fish points, and then we draw up our plan to preserve the wetland and using the fish points as buffer zones. And we've also allow some development within the buffer zone. So these are, uh, uh, if you like, our ecological infrastructure uh, of Hong Kong. And we have also done uh, land use, uh, land, landscape mapping uh, for the whole of the territory, just looking at the landscape value, the ecological value of the whole territory. And then we draw up, in this study, we draw up the so-called no-go area. These are the area that we should not meddle with leave them as it is for research, for public enjoyment, for conservation, to maintain biodiversity, so on and so forth. And we have to focus on those development, the land that are suitable for development. So we have a roadmap. Uh, sustainable development is our overarching goal for this uh, strategic plan. I'll come to what each of these uh, uh, topics uh, later on. Right, spend a bit of time on this one, I think it's worth. Uh, this is the rail network of Hong Kong. Uh, back in the 90s, we have identified rail to make Hong Kong, to keep Hong Kong moving efficiently, we need to depend on public transport. And of all public transport, rail development is our backbone. And we have this so-called uh, transit-oriented development on top of the rail station. And this is what we have now, and the green lines are uh, in the pipelines. This will be completed, uh, the extension will be 2014. To the south, the red line here will be 2015. Uh, also the uh, Sha Tin to Central Link, uh, 2018 and 20, maybe 2020 across the harbor. So with all this new network, I'm sure that 
This is what we have currently. This is uh, what I did in the paper uh, back in 2009, actually. Uh, the figure may have gone up a bit. Within 500 meters of our station, we have 75% of our commercial and office space, meaning jobs are concentrated there. Also, if you look at other like living quarters, some 42% of housing units are within five, <coughs> excuse me, 500 uh, meters of a rail station. Some of the uh, housing development areas are not really in the, uh, the, the CBD core, the core CBD. They are on the outlying area like new towns. But every day this removes people from you know, going to work and back home. And I would like to point out one very important point. Uh, to make this successful, you have to have very good design for the station and the connection. I'll come to that about our footbridge network. So that people can do multi-purpose multi trips like going to work, having their breakfast on the way, come back and do a bit of shopping before they go home, either by on foot or by uh, feeder service, we call them minibuses. Now, with this integrated land use and transport planning, we have a very compact urban form. We, we have a high reliance on public transport. And the secretary uh, mentioned this morning about 89% of all trips Daily trips, about 12 million, more than 12 million trips, 90%, 89% are using public transport. With high density and mixed use, we have a very uh, vibrant and diversified urban form. And it makes it easy for people to move around. Now, this is the central map, and we have a number of stations there. We have all this footbridge linkage and subways and and of course, this uh, uh, mid-level escalator. For those who are familiar with Hong Kong, will we'll realize that this now carry about more than 80,000 people a day uh, going to work from the mid-level, which is a residential area, going down to central, our central uh, business district. Uh, in addition, there are all other bridges. These bridges, some of these bridges are built by government uh, others are built by the private sector. We use incentive to provide them with extra plot ratio so that they can build the footbridge, maintain it, and, and, and operate it 24 hours a day for public use. One of our important strategy is the wise use of land resources in Hong Kong. We have we have very limited land resources. That's why we have to recycle the use of land, like this Taikushing residential area and also uh, other areas. Uh, previously, uh, you know, shipyards or industrial areas. And after the de contamination of land, we can use it for development. Um, it's not avoidable to encroach on the greenfield sites sometimes, but we have to be very, very prudent. So. These are the new development areas in the new territories. Uh, some of them are being used for open storage at the moment. Others are greenfield sites, but for those areas with woodland or mature trees, we will preserve them as open space for the new development areas. These are not new towns. They're much smaller than size. Our usual new town is more than well over half a million people. We are talking about you know, uh, 100,000 to 200,000 people for these uh, so-called NDAs. Now I can skip through this. This, this I mentioned earlier about the no-go areas. And you'll be amazed uh, if you're in Hong Kong, in the urban area, there's hustles and bustles, streets and all activities, but about you know, half an hour, 15 minutes drive, you're in the country park, beautiful landscape. And this is something the local community really treasure, and we have to maintain them. So about 90% are living within uh, three kilometers of the country park. Uh, very quickly on the open space, uh, we have the country park and other open spaces, and 80% uh, of the population are living within 400 uh, meters of the district park or open space. Actually, for comprehensive resi residential developments, uh, they are self-contained in terms of uh, uh, open space and some uh, fa communities, facilities like primary schools and so on. It's not just the number 
matter, the quality of open space is important. What we're trying to do is to link up most of this open space into a network of open space. Uh, at the moment, a lot of work is being done on both sides of the Victoria Harbour, thanks to uh, Christine and the others uh, advocating the preserving of the harbour, and now we're trying to build waterfront promenade around the harbour uh, on both sides of the uh, harbour. Now, I can, uh, we, we can improve our built environment by doing better urban design. Uh, we have adopted air ventilation assessment at the plan making stage, and for large projects, uh, we use AVA as well, and I don't need to go through this. Um, this is a summing up of what I just said. I'm running out of time, but before I leave, I uh, highlight a critical issue as uh, suggested by Ricky about a few days ago. Um, what we are facing now, Hong Kong is a, is a global city. We are the third largest financial center after London and New York. Uh, according to the Globalization and World Cities Network, Hong Kong is also the third largest global city in terms of international connectiv connectivities with all these so-called uh, advanced producer services. So we uh, have a very strong demand for land for offices. That's why Kerry mentioned about the Kowloon Yees, our second CBD this morning. We have, land for, we have to reserve land for um, hospitals, for data center. They are all coming to Hong Kong. Uh, MNCs, uh, I think according to the latest survey, more than 6,000 of them in Hong Kong, either regional headquarters, regional office, or local offices. So there's a huge demand for office space and other spaces. But how do we cater for them while maintaining or even enhancing our living quality? That is a challenge. Uh, and also very important, I think, is to ensure we continue to move people and goods in a very efficient manner. So this is we have to take into account. Last but not least, uh, we have to cope with a very uh, increasingly vocal community and diverse public views. The reason why I couldn't join the dinner last night was because we are in a hearing of a landfill site in Hong Kong, and you can imagine we started the meeting at 9 until 8, but there's still going to be two more meetings. So with that, these are not unique to Hong Kong, but I'm sure we can pick them up uh, in the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Jimmy, can, can I just ask you two, two questions? Thank you for that. But um, if you were to take Philip's presentation, and uh, obviously you haven't done the analysis, what is your sense, just sense, about uh, you have this extraordinary transport system anyway, where roughly 90% uh, use public transport. If you were to look at it in terms of um, education or income groups, do you think there's a considerable difference in terms of those uh, 500 meter distances, in terms of those uh, access to public transport for different social groups? What, what, what's your sense? Well, I, I don't have office no, there, no, I don't have just, a specific, just, uh, but just to help ba us. basically uh, for the uh, real station in the new territories, in the new town, they are um, basically public housing, so they are not well off, you yeah. know, just ordinary people, they use public transport. Right. But let me pick up that question raised by Professor Ho, he's left now, uh, that Kerry uh, is reluctant, was reluctant to answer. It's about this mobility thing, whether, you know, you give them subsidies. This is exactly what the government is doing. Uh, for a very long time, all full-time students, primary and secondary students, uh, have a subsidies in public transport. And also for now, we have a new scheme for people working full-time or part-time. They, they have 600 if they work full-time or 300 uh, Hong Kong dollars for transport subsidies. And, and so Provided they, they are eligible in terms of certain income level and assets. And also for elderly people, 65 or above, and for those people with disability, they can they just pay two dollars Hong Kong dollars, roughly what 16 pence uh, for one trip on the MTR, on the franchise buses, as well as on as well as on the ferries. So there's 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 some subsidies to enable, if you like, from the social perspective, that uh, we have to ensure that people less off will still be very very mobile. Within the and system. can I, again, a follow-up question just to clarify to us. You showed the parks, and it's an extraordinary range of quality of parks, very, very close by to uh, the, the dense structure of the city, and right. also increasingly number of, I guess, internalized 
public spaces in the city. Right? Given the subject of this conference and given the notion that we're interested in health and well-being, again, thinking of Christine's question yesterday to Dr. Chow and reversing it, given that you're in planning, mm. uh, I know you're not supposed to talk about other ministers or other departments' agendas, but I'm going to ask you to speculate anyway. What is the relationship in terms of people's health? Do, do, do you take that into account? Obviously, it's good, but do you have any way of... Um, testing that, getting feedback in terms of that. And, you know, we see it from, I think, outside as an extraordinary uh, uh, range of opportunities for people to just get out and let, let steam, uh, let, let off steam, effectively. But is this something which is part of your planning philosophy? This is what you said earlier on the local DNA. Hong Kong, no doubt, is a vertical development. And, and by the way, before I, I start explaining it, Hong Kong government operate as a team. I think Kerry is just joking about, you know, not meddling in other, other uh, policy bureau. I, I, for one, have talked about these subsidies. It is not tran t uh, transport and housing bureau. It's, it's the labor and welfare bureau. So we will basically a government work as a team to tackle uh, problems. But going back to your question, uh, I think the, this local DNA is people, no doubt the flat size of Hong Kong are, uh, uh, pretty small by, by world standard. And people like to, you know, on Sundays, a lot of people do is to have tea with their extended family in a Chinese restaurant, yum cha, and chit chat the whole morning. And also, it's, it's very important that uh, uh, our country park are so close by. Actually, yeah. a lot of people, just last Sunday, we have this charity walk in one of the country parks in Hong Kong. We have a few thousand people going there. So every year, there are more than 13 million people visiting our park. So it's, it's well utilized. This is a way to, if you like, compensate for the small size of the flat uh, in Hong Kong. Okay. So, oh, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll come back to you. So if I could now ask Kitam Tiwari to um, come to the platform. Thanks. Thanks.